Hello and welcome to Between Two Servers, the show where we talk about multiplayer games and netcode. With us today are Zach and Maka from Riot. Uh, Zach is head of infrastructure and live ops, and Maka is head of Riot Direct. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. Cool. It's awesome to have you guys here. So one, one thing that I want to sort of bring up straight up is that Riot Direct is a massive inspiration to me. Um, and, and actually, the company that I'm working at is, it's fair to say, directly inspired by some of the early articles about Riot Direct and the problems that you guys solved. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you guys and go through the full history of what you've done with Riot Direct. So, Zach, let's start a little bit about what you do at Riot and uh, maybe your background too, yeah? Yeah, sure. So I'm Zachary uh, Blitz. I was um, originally, uh, I think, thinking of my career as something in psychology or organizational psychology. Um, I, I started working uh, off the bat, uh, building teams in banks uh, that that would help uh, put in ACH clearing houses or uh, LMS systems. Uh, and learned very quickly that that was not what I wanted to do. Uh, I, jo I jumped over to uh, a SaaS provider known as Cornerstone On Demand. Um, I actually, I learned a lot about Agile there, um, which was awesome. And then, uh, you know, put out put out some pretty cool products and, and helped take the company public, which was, which was pretty awesome. Um, and then kind of got bored of that. I mean, my passion has always really been video games. It's it's something that I, I loved doing as a kid. Wow. It's great Hello. to be in the industry. Yeah. It really oh is the best God. thing. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I had an opportunity to become a part of Riot, uh, you know, I think, you know, seven, seven or eight years ago. And uh, I jumped at it because I, I love League of Legends um, and the people I who I was getting to work with people like Maka were just so, so smart and so ahead of their time and some of the things they were building uh, that I couldn't wait to be a part of it. So I was just started as kind of like an infrastructure project manager, honestly, and then uh, gradually sol solved bigger and bigger problems. And today, you know, I basically function as the GM product, the business lead um, for, for infra and for uh, our lives, live ops uh, organizations and, uh, it's one of the great pleasures of my life to work at Riot. It's been it's been absolutely amazing. That's awesome. So Manka, what's what's your background, mate? Uh, yeah. So I am um, before my before I landed in uh, in Riot in the gaming industry. Uh, before that, I was working in uh, in ISPs and carriers. Uh, so I I worked at a carrier called Comindico, based in Australia. Um, yep. I helped found uh, one called Vocus, which is now still running here. I think the third or fourth largest in the in the, uh, in the country, um, and I've kind of had a, a journey with startup carriers building um, from sort of very small to very large things, and how they can uh, both construct a network and improve it and leverage it over time to create value. Uh, yeah, and in 2014, um, I was approached by by Riot um, to sort of talk about a project they had, an idea they had around building this this network of their own. Uh, with a focus on sort of security and performance. Um, it did require relocation from uh, Australia to the US. So it was, it was a hard sell, but um, we, we got there in the end and um, Ride Direct sort of came about. That's amazing. So look, let's let's talk about Ride Direct. Um, what made it happen? What was the conversation? What was going on that, yeah. that made folks at Riot go, we should build our own private mm -hmm. internet for our game? Yeah, so league league was generally not stable uh, right. for for I think the the early years, and as league got more popular uh, after DreamHack, uh, I think I think we as a company desperately wanted to solve that problem and and th and thought of like a number of different ways to do that, um, but but the genesis was you know Riot is really built on solving player pain. Me, right. Me look yeah. at it like that. That is the thing that we care most about every day. You're um, looking at a, a problem of unstable network performance from one player to another, from one session to the next. Yes. And and you're like, how can we solve this? Yes. Okay. And for us, there is no greater calling, you know, truly than than to 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 make these games the way that we ourselves would want to play them. Yeah. And I remember a speech from an executive early on where in my in my time at riot where he he laid out like 
this really colorful um, example of him showing up to a WoW raid and his his local ISP basically being down and him feeling as though he had let down his entire raid yeah. group. Um, and we knew that we were unintentionally, I think, providing that same experience. You know, there there could have been nine other players uh, across the world uh, or across the United States, let's say, who who wanted to play, but yeah. because your ISP, you know, wasn't great, your you know, the, your middle mile routing wasn't and it's great. Not, it's not even bad all the time. Sometimes it's just bad for a bit, and then it's, yeah, sure. That's the thing that it just like blows my mind. It's not continuously bad. It's just not consistent. Yes. And and so for us, we didn't want to con- continue to kind of like perpetuate that problem for players. We wanted to solve it once and for all. So you built effectively your own private internet. What What is going on here? Because you're not laying fibers. You're not, not literally digging digging trenches and putting fiber down. So tell me, tell me about that. Yeah. So, so one thing I didn't touch on is where we have ISPs who are too small to justify mm-hmm. direct port access to us, we do make use of um, internet exchanges or peering points, and, and they're a really important part of the formula. Yeah. They, they generally provide a neutral. That's um, sort of like your catch all. Yeah. Kind, kind of like a, yeah, if there are 50 ISPs in the area, they can all connect to there, and I can connect into that, and I can get access to all of them um, over this point. But, and we're, at least we, know, we have a, a common, some of them are, are sort of member association type arrangements, set off profits, and some of them are commercial, but generally um, you have an engagement point where you can all mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of make an agreement and, and exchange things for the, you know, you can exchange traffic for free um, with each other with a guarantee that you're not going to mess with it or there'll be performance problems. And if so it's are, on two sides, like they, they have the guarantee that you're not going to mess with them and they're not going to mess with you. Ex- exactly. Okay. Yeah. You, you'll both provide equitable. Sounds support. complicated. Sounds, um, sounds sounds slow. It, it's I mean it's it's slower than a direct connection, but the, yeah, you know, okay. the, let's face it, the ports on routers cost money as well, a lot of yep, money. Yep, yep. And yep. um, you know, the, the other thing is uh, the cross connects that you pay for in inside a facility. You know, every every piece of glass you know that you run between you and another provider, there's yep. a cost per month for that. It's perpetual. Okay. Um, so uh, so so Zach, I think you have a uh, an image of of, of the network for. Uh, right direct from 2015 um so this this kind of this this image is i, I guess what you would call the completion of right direct v1 um we, we'd finished okay. our, our backbone in north america uh, was this, this the one point, where you moved to chicago for all your league players yeah so right. if you look at the it, it's very much a, a star style design based yeah. around chicago in the u.s okay. uh, because the idea was to onboard players in markets and get them back to chicago Okay. With the absolute lowest latency we could. So what was what was uh, this, the high level goal here? Uh, the high level goal was to provide you know so our our, our, our target was originally to get eighty percent of players under eighty milliseconds in North okay. America. Okay. Um, and you met that. Uh, we we smashed that. We actually yeah, moved brilliant. the goalpost to sixty um, milliseconds yeah. after we right. moved the servers to Chicago because um, because of the central location. Exactly. Yeah. So before Chicago, they were in Portland, uh, and yeah. Portland is a long way from the East Coast demographic, and yeah. <laughs> almost impossible yeah. to hit that 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 mark with. Uh, once we put the the servers in Chicago and did the relocation there, um, we were able to target most of the US. So to give you kind of an idea of the backbone speed, um, Los Angeles to Chicago from the office there, we were seeing sort of forty three milliseconds round trip times uh, once that move was made. So. Yeah. That's badass. Um, they, yeah. they did go from you know, sort of, I think, 20 ish, uh, 240 in, mm-hmm. in, in the LA area. And, and unfortunately, you know. Yeah, well, the last, that last mile is going to do that. Yeah. Uh, less the last mile. So it was, it was more like people are used to a certain experience. And if you look at the, the, life, the life cycle of those servers in North America, they were originally in Los Angeles, then they were in Oregon, and then they were in Chicago. So Kind of move um, around from the perspective of a player in LA, their, their ping might have been getting worse, but the stability of the of, of the um the experience should have been improving. Like the consistency uh, and overall, um, you know, hopefully the satisfaction with, with what they're getting uh, should have been better. So what um, you got here is you've got all these locations in the major metros. So you've got Los Angeles, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Portland. 
is yes. what is that Salt Lake in the middle? No, that's not. I'm an idiot. What's that one in the middle? Denver. Denver? Denver. Of course, it's Denver. Yeah. I should know this. This is my job too, in a different way. <laughs> um, Chicago, Dallas, um, and uh, you're not in Miami, but but you're you're in. Is that Atlanta? Yeah. Okay. So the initial the initial and Virginia, of course, and then New York. Is it Secaucus yeah. or or actual New York? Uh, we're actually in Ashburn. Uh, so if you go, if okay. you want to drive around Ashburn, Virginia, it's it, like but in data centers in, everywhere. In eighteen, though, or sorry, in fifteen, we were in New York. Okay. So you yeah, okay. uh, sorry, it's yeah, New York was in New York. That's in downtown New York in uh, yeah. one of the the, the carrier hotels there, at, uh, sixty Hudson. Got it. So it's it's there, and, and again, these are all targeted to be in 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 mm-hmm. carrier hotel locations. They're not the place where you get a hundred racks or two hundred racks and, and run your run your DC. Yeah, these yeah, are yeah, yeah. super dense. Um, so it's high, the meet me the meet me rooms and they're like the exactly. carrier hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and the power in these buildings is not scoped or set so this up. Will be, this would be like one Wilshire in LA. Exactly. And in fact, yeah. LA is in one Wilshire. And, um, and, and Cermak in, Cermak in Chicago? In, uh, Chicago, yep. Look at me. Uh, I know a little bit about networking, but so little. <laughs> I, hey, <laughs> so everybody, exactly. Maca, Maca has forgotten more about networking than I've ever known. This hey, is Gwen. extremely important. It, yeah, it, go it ahead. It depends on the number of markets that you're in because once you've got to start remembering the the, 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 the addresses in, in, in Europe and other parts of the world, you just... And, and their street names are a lot longer than ours yeah. you know, than in, in, in America. Amsterdam, <laughs> Frankfurt, London. Yes. Um, so so in, 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 in Europe, our servers were in, in Frankfurt and Amsterdam at that time. Yep. So you kind of see we have a protected ring uh, around those sort okay. of core sites there to try and you know, account for value. So it's, but... it's, it's really a funnel, right? Yeah. It's really a funnel. So, so you really, you're, let's break this down into two parts. And this, this is something that, I, that I, I do as well in Network Next very differently. Like I, I'm not a network engineer, I, but, but the, the same concept exists because you've really got two things you need to do. The first thing is you've just got to get good connectivity to all the operator networks. And then you've got to get these really hot links yeah. from A to B, yes. right? So talk, maybe let's talk about the links. So we've got two different regions. We've got the USA going to Chicago, and then we have uh, Europe going to Amsterdam. And, uh, and, and Frankfurt. Oh, Frankfurt, excuse me. Yeah. And uh, tell, tell me about the links from those, from those satellite pops through to the place where you're hosting the servers. I mean, traditionally, again, because our original model was to kind of fail open, uh, mm-hmm. we didn't build too much protection here. We 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 mm-hmm. ran the risk that if a if a if a link got cut, which happens more often than not, yep, um, public internet to, for you, yeah, uh, civil civil works or just you yeah. know building a freeway or a train line or other things or just people who want to steal what they think is copper and they find out it's not copper yeah. <laughs> when they've dug yeah. it up. Um, <laughs> you know, we we get a lot of these incidents where isolation was happening more than we would like um okay. so the, the v1 on model was definitely foul open um and uh what what i'm just trying to check 2015 was kind of i guess the end of the experiment it was the like can we can we prove that there is value here that we improve engagement we improve performance um and, and i think we did achieve that okay we kind of like kind of you know, at this point there are other shards that are not getting this service so you mentioned miami miami yeah, is yeah, where we yeah. had our ladam shards um right so okay. north was based there um and i believe we were still That's got, that does have great connection to latin america i mean the other one really is dallas yeah but but, but miami more so although yes. i've seen a lot of a lot of isps love going up through new york by default the, the it's the so thing, nuts the thing i would contextualize from a business standpoint like kind of at at this juncture Right. right in in the process is that it was starting to get a little bit controversial in, internally um, because was it was it, expensive it was right? driven by cost okay. right exactly yeah. and and the other main driver was it in areas in regions we hadn't entered yet right. um, we were going to want to do this right like we right. weren't ever going to now want to launch a region without so this. not only was it expensive now it's like and we got to expand it geographically and it's exactly. going to be even more expensive right and okay. and on top of that it was time consuming um, okay. because hardware lead times you know like you yeah, can, can kind of get i just spin mm, this up in a week yeah minus <laughs> minus countries minus countries where you know there are u.s embargoes or whatever right like generally speaking it's a little bit easier some of the network mm-hmm. timelines because you're just purely based on carriers like just just tend to kind of like um 
punch out like when we would lo- want to launch a region. So yeah. there was always this kind of pressure, like, well, why do we need it? Why do we have to have it? How do you um, how do you show it to them? How do you show right. it? You got to you got to well, be showing engagement and retention benefits. So, so it, I, right? Yeah, we had some leaders at the time who I think were really exceptional um, about talking, you know, talking about what the what the engagement did at specific right. milliseconds, and yeah. that was that was the thing that I think landed with um, like both can, the game devs and the rest of and the yeah. rest of the executive team, where it was kind of like, wow, I okay, totally, if, I, I if can players, totally back if players if players grok this, like yeah. we, you know, we should continue to do it. But I, it was it, it it was in its infancy, like still, I think uh, a bit controversial, and that that's kind of a theme throughout Riot Strike. Right, directs existence. All right, so so basically, you're here with a, a centralized region in Chicago for everybody, giving uh, less than sixty milliseconds for eighty percent of players, and uh, you you have both engagement and retention metrics that are showing that this this is doing stuff, right? Um, and uh, similarly in Europe. So what what happens next? Yeah. So at, at this point, I think it was the other regions are like, we want we, we want this too, like. Cool yeah, North yeah, America yeah. and Europe, you've got this yeah. toy. We want to join the parties. Hi, I'm Australian. <laughs> in, yeah. Um, so I believe the next step was, yeah, as we start costing out the current network model, we look at like the cost of these things to build and we're like, okay, we need to rethink some of our choices around how we've designed these sites because it's really expensive to roll this same footprint out everywhere. Um, yeah. And as, yeah, if we were to take the number of sites and model 30 more, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. what does that look like? Um, the other thing is, as you move away from what I would call the main internet corridor of like the traditional Europe to North America to mm. um, to sort of Japan, old I call it the old corridor now because yeah. things have moved a lot the last six seven years. But traditionally, it was kind of Europe to the US was 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 the model. Um, bandwidth got very 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 expensive. Um, okay. I mean, I, if you want to jump to the next the next view of the network, Zach, if we jump forward to um, uh, 20, 2018, was it? Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're in APAC now. So 2018 was kind of, I guess, the completion. Oh, and South America too. Yeah. So this, awesome. is, this is the completion of all the, all the regions Riot had launched in already. Um, mm-hmm. we, we also had moved Turkey from Frankfurt to Istanbul and built into Turkey. Um, that was no small feat and, and, and a huge amount of effort and work to get that done. Um, and, and these these circuits and these links that go across the Andes between Buenos Aires and uh, and um, Santiago, thank you, yeah. and yeah. South America. And up, up, to, up to Sao Paulo. We're, yeah. we're talking 150K a month US Jesus. per link at this point in time. This was yeah. like a yeah. huge investment in, in terms of how can we make it so these... and, and if you know, and you're paying that even if you don't put traffic over it, you're just paying that. Yeah, uh, and the yeah. fact is, like, you got to have two of them because if you cut yeah, that yeah, link, yeah. where's it going to go? One goes down. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the fact that it does go across the Andes, and there's you know snowfalls and landslides mm-hmm. and other problems there, like you have to you have to deal with with the sort of the topography of the area. So, so um, so now are you still bringing South America up to Miami, or is or are you in Sao Paulo now or somewhere else? Yeah, so, so so we we do have a, a server location for that am south in in Chile and did have that before. Okay, but rather okay. than just having that behind a single provider, it now yeah. has the the backbone connectivity and the ability for us to get um, player traffic in there from other locations. Um, mm-hmm. This this again, this is twenty eighteen, um, yep. and we'll talk more about later yep. on the, the other the other improvements. It's interesting to see how it evolves. Like you you try different things and and yeah. You know, you also notice there's a lot more redundancy in Europe on this from the last slide. You'll see there's a lot more sort of right. between things and a lot more. Uh, and you're still you're still centrally taking to Frankfurt. Uh, at this point, I believe 2018, we were starting to look at the shutting down Frankfurt and okay. consolidation into Amsterdam. Um, right. I, I believe 2018 was around the time when we started the project to move all the European servers into one location in Amsterdam. Yeah. Because Turkey was already moved out down to Istanbul. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you know, there's I think kind of a dream that we might one day re- try and kind of reunify that as a single region. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's a scale problem, obviously, when you look at the, the density though, the number of players and you know what we can do with the, the back end. So effectively, um, just for everyone looking at this, you're you're looking at 
redundant private dark fiber lit up or 10 gig waves or wh whatever you're doing for depending on the link it's going to be slightly different yeah. uh, a, a completely custom private network between all these points and then at each of these points you you have uh, really high quality connectivity to as, as many isps that you can get so there's no middleman in between them it, and you it, it, exactly. massive advantage for you guys Massive. And, and, and the, the big thing to, to not understate here is the number of providers you have to both deal with an engineer for. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't touch on it in the last, the last section, but when you deal with a provider like a, a Comcast or um, a Spectrum in, in North America, mm -hmm. you're not just taking a port in each location. You have to carefully engineer the flow of traffic. And one particular problem we had with League of Legends was all the game servers had a public IP address and so getting traffic into us was easy and, and having, you know, having it find the fast route into Riot was easy. Yep, getting okay. it back from the game server to the correct point of origin. Oh, so in the, the other point was actually trickier. Okay. So so yeah. this, this is one thing I remember talking with someone in the past about. The the, the people don't know that the, the route that the packets take up over uh, IP hops is yes. not necessarily symmetrical up and down. No. Exactly. You think of like a, a router has a large phone book on it, or a large yep. forwarding table, and every packet that comes in, it looks at the table and it sends it out where it, yeah. where it, where it, where it can go. That's where it does it. It routes forward. Yep. It doesn't look at where you, where you came from. And what, what, has to what, what, what wall do I throw this packet over? Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so in this case, engineering to try and, you know, and, and it, it, it's not a constant. All these ISPs, all these networks are continuously merging and acquiring yep. and demerging and yep. making yep. their own changes. So you'll fix it one day. And yeah, you got to go reverse engineer the architecture. Yeah. So you've also got to have a pretty strong feedback loop um, from the, the games telling you like how performance is overall, but then kind of keep an ear to the ground for players who say yeah. things. And there are a few I have my, my details on Reddit. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Do occasionally, and, and of engage. course, you guys, you guys have excellent analytics and data science teams, and so on. I, so, I have I the think... analytics, but but the problem is, we also have a finite number of hours in a day and number of team yeah. members. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. you you might get you know ten players in a region have had a their the performance go poorer. Yep. Is is that the threshold where I prioritize that work above everything else we have to get yep. done for the thousand players and ten thousand players or the entire game? Yeah. Um, no, it makes sense. Hey, so Zach, tell me, like, from, from the high level, zoomed out point of view. Yeah, sure. Where, where are we at right now in 2018? What's going on, and how how are you all feeling about Riot Direct? Yeah, so this was this was the point where I think we decided Maka to put the put the WAN on too, because we we yeah. Riot Riot right. now has a proliferation of offices, right. um, and so Riot needs you know creatives to be able to share assets between mm -hmm. uh, um, between offices. So I think you have the proliferation of the riot office. I think people at this point had accepted like this was something that we were, um, you know, going riot to. does this now. This exactly. is a riot thing. Yeah. But I don't know. Um, and and I think it's I think it is is was reasonable at this point. Yeah. Were we going to put all of the games behind Riot Direct? That was actually the highly controversial statement. Was what what does multi tenancy look like, um, and and why? What's what is the reasoning for it? I remember having discussions with with uh, a number a number of uh, EPs that were kind of like, yeah, but not for my game because I don't want to take oh, the PL yeah. hit. Uh, I don't. Oh, okay. I don't, so there's, I don't there's like the internal box thing. Exactly. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think the performance actually matters for my player base. Um, and so, you know, the controversy slips from like, kind of like company wide to more localized to specific game devs in some of the titles that we were trying to put out. This is something I didn't actually know. So you, you, you have effectively built out a private internet for your game. And, and then you were able to leverage that for your different offices around the world for your workflow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. At, well, everybody knows this now going home, working in COVID that it's really, it's really not that good out there when you're sinking a gigantic <laughs> per force <laughs> dump. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Um, Guys, I'll see you tomorrow, the, you know? The, the comms <laughs> between our data centers and offices were handled via like tunneled internet or like IPsec tunnels and things over some info that had been there for, for, for a long time and always just worked. It wasn't until um, 
I, I believe it was one of the old monitoring, uh, I, I dare not say the name, Zabbix, um, uh, problems we were having in Miami because Miami was host to the back end for all of right. Brazil and Latin America yeah. and had to push uh, some sort of state data from a system there up to Portland. And the the tunnels were just not up to the, up, up to the scratch anymore. It was just not working. And um, uh, the, the head of Infra at the time kind of just came to me and was like, I don't understand. We have a network that goes from here to here, here to here. Why, why can't we just use that? And I'm like, we can and uh, and you did. I think in two hours we'd built our first private link over, uh, <laughs> That's over network between our Portland data center and Miami. Yep. Um, and, and once folks got wind of that, that was a thing. Uh, Every, everyone and was on. Like, yeah. How can we get everything else? Well, and Maka Maka Esports specifically. I mean, I think I yeah. think that was that was a major customer too, uh, or, or I would say like our second customer after after games after oh, League okay. of Legends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the, least, the esports use case was a bit different as well. Um, they, they had a, a desire to, um, first of all, again, we, we look at League of Legends as the platform backend that runs, uh, you know, either in the cloud or, or, in, or in data centers. Mm -hmm. And then there's the game servers, which for esports were normally on site. They need reliable connectivity from on site to um, to whatever where the platform is. And um, by having a, a point of presence near a live event. Area. So, say that they were doing um, something in you know, Paris or similar, mm -hmm. it's like, well, we've got a, a site down the road. We can buy a tail that just goes down there rather than buying a link all the way back to the studio in Berlin or a studio in LA and then a truck for satellite to protect it and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and um, th they kind of pioneered this model where initially it was just for that the service connectivity and, and, and for you know, green room access to the internet and stuff. And that has now become a, a full-on um, production model where we, we produce the shows back in our central studios and, and they use the connectivity from the site to our point of presence to carry that broadcast um, back to a production point, do all the, the, the post-production and, and send it back to the site um, you know, for presentation to players and, 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 and all that. So they're able to also save... Um, flying people around the world, which in yep. this time now is an incredible advantage. So you you um, actually now at some point moved back to Australia. Now you're by the beach down down Sydney beaches, I, I, southern I, I southern live, New South Wales. Uh, I do live, yes. Good down, on you. Sli down slightly down jealous here, you bastard. It's, uh, it's amazing. But um, for, for the esports model, essentially what it was was um, the number of staff that are flying to location to do a production was getting large. Okay. And I think when you start looking at travel logistics and expenses around that, um, that, 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 that sort of bloat in that number. So the network was actually saving money in other areas. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it was, it was, it was kind of a latent capability. We'd already built the ability to do mm. this. We used it for our production mode. We had, we had spare bandwidth. Um, you know, all, all it took was making sure we had the right engineering to not contend with, with gameplay. Yep. Yep. yep um, yep. And, and so and the gameplay is always first and then the internal studio stuff or the esports stuff is. Is is on a slightly lower priority. They're, they're both first, but in their own okay. in their own ways. Um, okay. Everybody is equal. Yeah, it's, it's it's gameplay is important because it's real time and you can't you know the, the less delay the better. Um, whereas esports and the, the stuff for them, if for a video broadcast standpoint, what's more important is is assured delivery. Um, they, they do use forward error correction and buffering on their mm -hmm, encoding mm -hmm. equipment to make sure they have things, but um. Yeah, the, the first feedback reports from our, our esports broadcast engineers were amazing. They're like, we've, you know, we're we're ex large American sporting brand, and we've never seen something that performs this well. Yeah, because oh, yeah. obviously that wasn't what the environments they came from were designed for. They'll kind of be part of the carrier. The carrier does it, and we're all good. But the carrier has a million other customers, and isn't interested in you know making sure that one is well served or or, or best served. That's awesome. Hey um, Zach. So now we've got this, this network, private network built for League of Legends, and it's expanded to internal connectivity between your offices. Uh, probably has a connection right to Macca's home, I, I would guess. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Lies. Okay. Um, and uh, esports video delivery. And now Riot moves from a single game studio to a multiple game studio. Yeah. And I think, I think the we got agreement... Um, we got agreement pretty quickly after some security incidents with league that 
you know, w- Riot Direct was, you know, a great defense mechanism as well. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so we, are and, we talking DDoS here specifically yes, for security? Yes, yes okay. absolutely. And, okay. um, you know, and, and we were on top of that going to build some more uh, DDoS products, which I'm not going to get into yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that would help as we, uh, as, as we kind of went forward and, and scaled the shooter because mm-hmm. we knew for mm-hmm. competitive integrity, as much as the millisecond matters, security and cheating and, uh, yeah. DDoS and all those you things. You can't have someone gain an advantage. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Or degrade and, someone else's experience. Yeah. yeah. So that became, that became the value prop, um, okay. for, for, for the game, for the game teams. Um, and they bought it. I mean, they, okay. they, they, so it's, so know, it's a protection. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's starting from, we have a network and we can get consistent performance and, and we have hard data from one of the largest, most successful games in the world that as late, you know, we look at latency brackets, this, this ties very specifically to levels of engagement and levels of retention, positive yes. ROI for improvement there. And, yes. and you wouldn't have done it if it wasn't, if it wasn't so right. Yes. And, and now you're going well, we can do DDoS on this too. And it's a protection thing for a game like Valorant that's competitive and uh, team-based. Yes. And and I would say even for Legends of Runeterra when it came out, mm-hmm. like there was a lot of work to do, I think, between 2018 and 2020. Uh, I, think, okay. I think that was one of the more ferocious periods because... Um, you know, the way Legends of Runeterra is structured is completely different from League and completely different from Valorant um, okay. and, you know, and and has kind of different key regions, uh, whereas yeah. Valorant is completely different than League and has separate, uh, has similar key regions, but, um, you know, we definitely didn't want to make some of the same mistakes that we had originally made with both Riot Direct and League uh, in the initial mm-hmm. rollout. And we kind of also knew that we were only going to have one chance to prove that we could do it as yeah. soon as we, as soon as we opened up for beta, um, mm-hmm. you know, and we can, we can talk a little bit about the way that closed beta worked and COVID and all that stuff. Cause I think it's all very fascinating. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, we, we knew going in that as soon as we opened the doors for beta, we were going to have millions of people trying to play our game, you know, maybe, maybe potentially hundreds of millions of people who are going to play our game. And we wanted it to be a great experience for yeah. every single one of those people. And that yeah. created, um, you know, at, at sometimes what felt like an unreachable bar right. uh, for what, for what quality and, and launch day experience was going. So you're, you're looking at time to do stuff. You're looking at time constraints. You're looking at how much it's going to cost. And you're looking at, well, what latency can we get everybody below? And you're trying to work out, the Very real, bad. the real joke. We we also wound up launching TFT in that window, and the joke internally was kind of like, we can't make this simple. Like, especially for us, where <laughs> we were going, like we literally went. I, like, if you look at the run, it was like TFT, Legends of Runeterra, TFT Mobile, Legends of Runeterra Mobile, Valorant. Okay. And that was like most most studios, especially with like one shared services team, most studios would do that over the course of like two years, you know, even yeah. even in a more aggressive fashion. And we aren't launching, you know, box products. We're launching these games as a service. Yeah. So it's not like, hey, we turn them on and it's done. You know, no we, way. We, we have to set it on and the work begins. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so that that was, I mean, I, I think and and Maka did a incredible job managing uh the team through that but that was that was you know very 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 difficult uh and and we could you know as ryan i don't think you know we we'd have it any other way so let's yeah, it, it, oh, go, ahead. go ahead funny thing where a team so a big part of this was capacity as well like okay we knew league very very well we'd run it for many many years we, so and, you, and you, we, you know it's peaks and troughs and you know we, we had really some content of optimizing and bandwidth and backbone okay. and capacity to be yeah. very very cost efficient for league mm-hmm. as our one one tenant originally with with the star model to central hosting in each region yeah yeah and and and, 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 and i told you before the league target was you know 80 percent of players at, at 60 milliseconds and we're good yeah so we, we have a meeting with valorant one day and they're like so our target's 35 milliseconds. Okay. <laughs> like, excuse me, like 30, 35. Uh, I'd like a pony, uh, sir. Like, and, 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 you know, you, you start the dance of like, well, yeah. how many server locations should we build for that? And it's like, well, how many can you afford to build for that? 
And they're like, well, just, just tell us how much it'll cost and then we'll tell you. It's like, okay. So Zach and then the team go away and we plan it and we go give them this like menu of selection and yep. they go, no, it's too much. <laughs> you, you want it cheaper, but we want the same. One like, so billion want, dollars. You want 35 milliseconds <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. But you know, so yeah, we start that negotiation and that 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 time it felt like it took a few months for us to narrow that, that plan down to start yeah. execution. That was a, that was a six month that was a six month dance. Um, yeah. and and it wasn't just us in the game team; it's us in Big Riot too, being like, do, yeah. do we even want to spend that much money to yeah. to roll this out? But it was critical to the game's thesis, so it was a conversation that was really worth having in terms. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. It's and it's and. What it, what it really meant is, you know, we had to be very creative around selection, like, like looking at our current demographic. We, we built tools based on our big data we had from, from League to look at where are our players today, what performance do they get. We were modeling server locations, um, you know, and, and then again, it was like, can we even get servers in these locations? Um, because, you know, you might think that the middle of the desert is a great place to reach a lot of places, but then you're like, is there a data center there? No. Seems okay. to be lacking uh, in electricity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, connectivity, electricity, people yep. to go work at, uh, can, can be a problem as well. So, um, sorry, that was hard. And uh, I mean, you know, I think the next slide we have looks at the, the 2021 model. This is kind of the where we are today, the post Valorant launch. So it's 2021, and yeah. what, what's the big what's the big change here? I mean, look, whoa, really? Okay, so I see that you've taken Peru up to Miami through uh, uh, Colombia, right? Is that Bogota? That one might be under construction. That might be coming okay. in the next uh, eight weeks. Okay, cool. Uh, well, I'm yes. I'm still impressed. Um, yeah. And so that's a really great result for South America because previously you were going down to Chile, and then you had to kind of ring around. Big, the big Amazon thing in there is a bit of an obstacle for for stuff for cables. Uh, yeah, that, that that big forest. Yeah, um, it's a not the Jeff. Uh, get hard company. to lay the cable there, and uh, we see some really good. Oh, and that's that's Hawaii there in the middle now. So you've got a Hawaii land. Uh, no, that, that that's an artifact of a um, plotting a, a line on a on a sphere that is turned into a flat. Oh, that's uh, funny. Object. Okay, well, uh, so unfortunately, sorry. Hawaii. There's sorry, the, Hawaii. The, and, and the cable does run actually. I think through Hawaii for Southern Cross, but. Uh, yeah. We, we, we don't have um, anything there. The, the, the dots are where the points of presence are. Um, and just because it's a pop doesn't mean it's a server location. Okay. Uh, this is how we connect it all together, not necessarily where we serve games from. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Yeah. you can see, again, there's a big focus on um, redundancy, multiple paths. Oh, and you've got Mexico really too now. That's, Mexico is um, fantastic. Mexico was a massive, yeah. massive undertaking. That is to hard get, to um, get connectivity in there. Yeah. You know, even once we built it for Valorant's launch, it still took us a year to get yeah, to all the providers out. down there um, talking to us, plugging in, getting on board. That's, um, that's, that's an amazing achievement because, I mean, most of the time, the best that you can do is here's a server in LA, here's a server in Dallas. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's remarkably difficult to get um, good hosting in. I, I found personally hosting in Peru and Colombia and Mexico that, that also it may have good local connectivity to the operator networks, Mm-hmm. But it's very difficult to find it that has local connectivity to the operator networks and good backhaul elsewhere. I've, Maka, I've found that. Maka will not give himself like this credit. So I'll, I'll, I'll go <laughs> I'll go and team, I'll talk about it for him. Yeah, the team. The, sorry, he and the team. Um, yeah. And this is true of the people who are building the DDoS products as well as like the, the network engineers. So the timeline accelerated. Um, pretty viciously, like we, we had built, you know, what felt like a, a pretty achievable schedule to roll out the, the diff between this map and 2018, um, you know, three years, you know, we just kind of jog there and, you know, we'd be there in time, in time for the launch. Um, and then what happened when COVID hit Ooh, um, yeah. was we went, we went into friends and family alpha for, for Valorant was pretty good. Um, okay. then we went to closed beta, um, mm-hmm. which, which was really during COVID and all of a sudden every, it felt like everyone who looked at the Twitch homepage was watching, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Valorant and we, we didn't want to offer invites very rapidly, um, right. you know, for, for players. And it created this weird demand thing where people were like, you know, doing all this stuff to get invites and streaming on like 17 different channels for drops. Um, 
but you know, Dave uh, Hieronymus, who who Glenn, I know yeah. you know, was who's yeah. the you know yeah, we, the, we we worked together back on Team Bondi. Yeah, the the Way software back. director came to, came to Maka and I and was like, look, like we need to give this game to as many people as fast as possible and capitalize on this moment because yeah. we didn't, you know, before it, we had no credibility. I, Anna, Anna Donlin used to talk about this a lot. Like we didn't have a ton of credibility in the FPS space. Right. Um, and the fact that people were interested, like we really needed to capitalize on that. Um, but what that meant was Maka basically building redundancy in all of these, you know, Maka and team in all of these places on like basically half the amount of time wow. that we originally considered uh, for the project. And that was, um, you know, almost backbreaking for, for that yeah. team. I mean, it was really, really difficult, uh, how, but we wanted many, to serve players. You how know? many folks are on your team, Maka? Uh, all up around 22, oh, 23. Good, good crew. Across, across the org, yeah. And, good and, number and, of guys. And what what, and what was also difficult is we were rebuilding the network while it was still running League of Legends at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're changing. We're, we're going to the next generation of equipment, getting off of our old um, our older stuff from the original build onto our newer high high capacity stuff. So you're going 100 gig at this point, or from 10 to 100 gigs in many places to, yeah. to handle the capacity that we we we, we foresaw we would need. Mm-hmm. We were installing the new services that we had built for Valorant's Edge um, routing. Some of the security and, and routing gear had to be like it was new software we had written that needed new servers to run on in, in our points of presence. Mm-hmm. So getting getting these servers ordered, scheduled, and shipped, and this is where the, the beta became challenging is because we're getting reports that, hey, uh, you, you promised latency here, but it's really, I'm seeing this. It's, yeah. it's, it's up here right now. What are you going to do about that? It's like, we've got a schedule, launch is planned for here. We're still getting things dropped in. They're getting installed every night. So you're, you're, with, you're with not the full set of locations at this point for it, servers. Exactly. Like they, they okay. might have had traffic coming in but it couldn't route the right way and and because again with league of legends we burned a lot of public ip addresses yeah and we knew we didn't have enough ip addresses for valorant and also we think about the future and forward planning we're like this game probably needs to be multi-protocol and sport v6 as well okay i don't want to dual stack deep into the data center so i need i need a, a plan or a method to get players from both the v4 and v6 or eventually able to play on the same server um, so we, we we designed and built this product that would handle that for us, but we had to get it out there. We had to get it into all these sites, but mm-hmm. it's why you might see Valorant runs on a set of 10 IP addresses globally. They're, they're any cast. So it's an any cast address and you're working out where to go. You, you, hit, on... you hit the edge device and it, it, yeah. it'll then look at you and where you should be going and, and in build okay. a, a build a thing to route you to the right place. Again, that also you, helps just a, just a wee bit with DDoS too. It also, I mean, if, if it can't find you allocated to a server, then it doesn't know where to send you, so it can. So it doesn't. Well, yeah. Yeah, the, other, the other thing that I think happened when we saw the capacity numbers is we realized, I think, for the first time, you know, in Riot Direct's um, existence, that we needed to go a little bit more hybrid than we were anticipating. Um, okay. With with you know utilizing cloud. And this uh, this is COVID, so that, that there's massive supply chain issues. You, you yes. can't exactly ask someone to go out and yes. risk their life direct server. Yes. And Maka was, was, you know, he was on calls with me like every day being like, we need to figure out a way to kind of like uh, spread the load um, so that, you know, everything is not going to the same data center in central Europe. Um, and I remember, I remember okay. like having, or, or making sure that like, Hey, like performance wise that, you know, this specific area didn't. And that was where Glenn, I know you and I, you know, we spoke about outposts, but like outposts. the out, outposts. A- AWS really outposts. outposts. That's right. So, this, so I think, I think AWS this is edge as well. Yeah. Oh, so, so, so there's an edge product and then there's an outpost and an outpost is just a, basically a cabinet they drop in. Yeah. Yeah, we have exactly. And, and in some of the places where, you know, we didn't have data center presence, we didn't have regions, we didn't have pops that existed, you right. know, the, the outpost was going to just be, drop an outpost. It was yeah. going to beat, you know, whatever we were going to put there, you know, yeah. um, and, and especially as we kind of got you know, I mock within like six weeks of launch day. I think that was, you know, when we pulled yeah. some triggers. And, yeah, it was and, hairy. And I think even then we didn't deliver it till a month after launch. It was like there was yeah. still time to get the thing built, get it, get it installed. But we at least we knew that we could make good on the promise to players. Like 
we were doing our very best during a very trying time globally to get. Yeah, I mean, not, I mean, place, everything yeah. was everything was melting down, and every weekday as well was basically a weekend. Yeah, I think I, I, think, I saw that on other games. Yeah, yeah, people people forget. Mock and I had this eth- you know ethics conversation that was like, I feel bad sending someone to a data center right now because of the state of the world, and I was like, yeah. I agree with you. Like, we should yeah. we should talk to this person before we sent them to the yeah. data center and make sure they're okay with it um yeah. it, because it was you know these were in places where you know numbers were high and you know we were, <laughs> we were trying to like right. like balancing we, all this was very challenging we had milan sitting like in in freight waiting to be built for a long because mm-hmm. like we had we had a, a obviously yeah. a pop there already we had to upgrade to get the new gear in there and it's like but the Italy, sat yeah. holding because milan was one of the first places locked down yeah. in europe during covid and it's like i feel really bad trying to get you know, one of our remote hands guys from Europe into Milan right now, because like, and players understood, you know, you know, we, we went public with that and we're like, Hey, we're not gonna, we're not going to put something in Milan and risk people's lives. Like we're, yeah. we're going to wait. And, you know, the players were like, yeah, that totally makes sense. And, and, you know, our players are awesome. Uh, obviously like yeah. you know, we back and I love them to death. And, and I think, I think like, you know, they, they got it. They got yeah. it. So you, you noticed this, this is the thing. So, you, you went from this centrally hosted, you know, Chicago and Frankfurt or Amsterdam and Europe and uh, moving around a bit in South America and various other places. And then now you're like East Coast, West Coast, Southwest, you know, North, like you're, 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 you're going around many more locations for servers than you did with League for Valorant. And you actually did launch without all the locations you want and players noticed, right? I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate, like yeah. we, we, we're doing the right thing. We're planning. We, we, we were on the right track because the players were noticing and, and we're already on. Yeah. And Greg, Greg street, who was at blizzard, who was one of, you know, ghost yeah. crawler for a while. Um, you know, he, he made like a thank you video. Uh, there's a couple of people, uh, you know, on the executive team who did. And one of the things that Greg said that, that stuck with me forever, especially cause I'm a huge you know, wow guy was like, I've never seen somebody launch as many games as stably as we did, let alone like yeah. one game, you know? And, and I think uh, short of like one kind of launch day snafu, like Valorant was exceptionally smooth. Legends of Runeterra was exceptionally smooth. TFT, yeah. you know, although, you know, not, not as much fan for fair was exceptionally smooth. And I think it's, it's largely due to the fact that Maka and team were able to, you know, distribute traffic in, in yeah. healthy ways. And we were able to utilize Riot Direct. I, 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 that's awesome. I, I don't, I don't see, I don't see us doing it without that. Yeah. That's amazing. So how many years in are we now on Riot Direct, Maka? Uh, it feels like yeah, seven, seven years, uh, wow. I believe is my, 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 my tick over on my, <laughs> <laughs> and many uh, more. So yeah, so it's, it's seven and a bit so far would be the, the sort of current length, and um, that's awesome. You know, it's, so it's, yeah, you've 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 heard it here. The secret, the secret sauce, not so secret anymore. Riot directs amazing infrastructure, powering both their their older games, uh, but also connectivity between their offices and their esports businesses, and saving everyone working at home during COVID. What's the future of Riot Direct, guys? It's Where does it go? Point. Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's already very impressive. And I, yeah. I don't know, but I, I, Maka, I know there's like, no, no, I want to, you know, there's always going to be, I want to do this, I want to do that. But Zach, I, I think, know how, I know how right it is. Yeah. It's going to come from what the game needs. I think, I think in a lot of ways, um, the, the future is still like a little bit cloudy. I think we, yeah. we hear, we hear whispers internally about cost again, right? Like, okay. you know, and that, yeah. that we need to mitigate, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I, or, 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 you know, get cheaper in certain areas. And we, we work yeah. a lot, we work a lot on that, you know, we're still scaling down, I think in some ways from Valorant and what we anticipated the Valorant peak to be. I mean, that work is still, you know, still going on a year later. So a lot of efficiency work exactly, both in terms of exactly. performance and cost. Yeah. And uh, I would say, I would say for me, um, I look at the MMO as an opportunity to continue to utilize it in, right. in a healthy way. And that's, that's, you know, that could be a decade out. I Connecting don't, people like, over I, really yeah, far yeah, distances. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't want to make it seem like that. That's, you know, I think Greg and team would go crazy if, yeah, yeah. that, that could be, you know, you know, <laughs> double digit years out. One but region. I, Earth. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah Mars, right, right. Mars. Mars. Uh, too, sorry, right, right, right. right. Cannot fix that. Yeah, but I think yeah, I think uh, stepping uh, towards uh, that will, you know, pay. You pay you, stepping towards that, I think, will help us help us continue to get better. So, so Mako, when when will Right Direct be interplanetary? Yeah, so we, we should call Elon and get a pop built on one of his moon bases. Uh, I would. I would actually really there. like. I would. There's a few things I would really like. I, I hope, I wish somebody would build a floating data center halfway between New York and London. That'd be fucking cool, right? I wish somebody would, would build a really cool pop in Panama and have a North South America centralized location for play. I think yes. that'd be really cool. Um, and uh, packets in space with Starlink, guys. That's badass. It's, 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 it's badass. It's, it's, it's the, the problem, but is latency being variable and objects yeah, moving. Yeah. Because because you're literally tracking a you're 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 on a you're on a you're on a little sawtooth because you're yeah. flipping from one satellite to the other and uh, it's kind of cool I I just love the idea of it but but I do I do think that you you know is the reliability going to necessarily be the same as 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 cables exactly. maybe not initially so the other one I, I want to touch on real quick with the future as well is like we have a lot of work still to do in mobile uh, and okay. and v six. Uh, like like for us, we've been running mobile for for a day. We, we haven't really had the chance to fully optimize performance and improve it. Um, the the hard thing is when we talk about peering and interconnect. Mm -hmm. If there's no load, there's no conversation. You can't you can't talk. You can't to go. I've got no stage. load yet, so I want to interconnect with you. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. It, what it's a not horrible really have a base load that you yeah. can have that discussion, or they're like, uh, like you just have to hook up a packet generator and just go. We got load, guys. <laughs> You, you could do those things. Yeah, that Probably would be that quite would be expensive. Ethically challenging. <laughs> ethically challenging. Um, but uh, I, I mean, there's that part. And we also, again, the V6 side of things is big for us. We, yeah. We've built the building blocks to be able to get the V6 support into our games. Uh, we have some more infrastructure and network work to do. Mm -hmm. I get emails all the time about like, why aren't you guys peering V6 yet? Why aren't you guys anything V6? It's like, it's coming. We're, we're, we're working on it. It's, um, okay. it's, it's a long journey. It's because we're not just talking about turning a switch in the network we have you know not you got to run dual stack for a transition you got to wow there's a lot of stuff we'll, there. we'll probably have to serve dual stack forever on the edge in terms okay. of a player on v4 or v6 so you can, you can make your internal us. network v6 yeah okay but think about the regression and the regression testing and like yeah. what if they get worse performance on v6 and v4 and then how mm -hmm. we handle mm -hmm. those scenarios do we build intelligence into the clients to check i've thought about that too kind of like which one do I pick? Because I mean, the routing is 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 totally not related. There's it's no different. relationship between yeah. the two they, routes. They, they, they can yeah. go completely different paths, and, and yeah. so you know. And, and then um, we we didn't touch on it. We have a website lag report where we report yeah. um, our, our latency data for League of Legends, yeah. and um, how we would integrate that with kind of you know V6 and future games is also mm -hmm. a, a conversation we're talking about. In terms Love lagreport.com. It's the ultimate name and shame. Thank you. Yeah, it's really cool. Awesome. So, guys, the the magic of Riot Direct and uh, Maka, the, the you know head of Riot Direct at Riot, and Zach, uh, head of infrastructure and live ops, telling you how it's done. Have a great night, everybody. Cheers. Here's the hard truth: the internet doesn't care about your game. After all the blood, sweat, and tears you put into making your game, you launch, and some players get terrible network performance. What can you do about it? Build your own internet? This is why we created Network Next. Network Next is a radically new way of linking networks together. It's a new internet. One where networks compete on a neutral marketplace to carry your game's traffic. Network Next puts you, the game developer, in control of the network. We monitor every player's network performance and you choose when to accelerate them. Not only will you see better network performance for your players, you'll also have the security of knowing that if one network is congested, we switch to another in seconds. Now you control the network.